listening, editing, sharing. Three memos on podcasting for the next online education. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with that feeling. When you deliver a lecture by talking to the screen of your laptop, 20, 30, 40 students silent in the virtual classroom, their camera and microphones regularly turned off. Are they following? Are they interested? Are they there? <laughs> and then a comment pops up in the chat box to remind you that yes, you are not alone. You are not simply talking to yourself. My name is Emanuele Fantini and I'm senior lecturer and researcher at IC Delft, the Institute for Water Education in the Netherlands. And this has been indeed a recurrent feeling in the past month of my work. And it has been quite frustrating. So last year I decided, okay, if I cannot see the students, then they're not going to see me as well. And I started to use podcasts that are already made as teaching material. Initially, it was just to flip the classroom. Instead of reading an article or watching a video, I was asking the students to listen to a podcast. But then, instead of recording video, lectures and video presentations, I started to record new podcasts, specifically for online education. And then I started to reflect on this process. I'm interested in the pedagogical, the political, the ethical and philosophical implications of everyday online teaching and online research practices. And I'm equally interested in the implications of the digital tools and the technologies that we used in these activities. Why this reflection? It is my personal attempt to answer the question asked by Bruno Latour and the Sciences Po Media Lab last year. Where to land after the pandemic? Instead of going back to the pre-pandemic world, which is not sustainable, what did we learn during the lockdown and which ideas, tools and practices do we want to bring with us in our new professional life, in what will be the next education. And since I enjoy listening to and making podcasts, and having seen that students seem to enjoy it as well, in the next education, I would like to use podcasts in a more systematic and conscious way. Italo Calvino was an Italian writer and intellectual and is one of my favorite authors. The book Six Memos for the Next Millennium collects the five Charles Eliot Norton lectures that Calvino was meant to deliver in 1985. Unfortunately, he died a few months before that. Those lectures were devoted, and now I'm quoting, to certain values or qualities or peculiarities of literature that are especially close to my heart, in an effort to situate them with a view to the new millennium." End of quote. I think we are now in education at a similar turning point that has been accelerated by the pandemic. A new education, a sort of new millennium in education. An education system is winding down and the new one is in the making. So I would like to briefly touch upon three values or features of podcasting that are close to my heart, to use Calvino's word, and that I consider relevant for this new education, for the next education, being it online, on land, perhaps blended. All these three values that I will discuss revolve around voice. The first is listening listening to the voice of your interlocutor. The second value is editing or listening to your own voice as author. And the third value is sharing, listening to the voices of your audience. 
first memo, listening. The first value, listening, is about the voice of the interlocutor. Interviewing someone for a podcast is more than a normal interview for a research. You acknowledge that person as someone that deserves to be publicly broadcast. I was initially surprised by the reaction of people when I invited them to join as guests. They felt honored, as if I was a very famous host with thousands of followers, which of course is not the case, but the very fact of publicly listening to people and acknowledging their expertise helped to create or to reinforce relationships and connections. And last November, for a module called Leadership and Collaboration for Sanitation Change within a Master in Sanitation, I recorded with Andres Cabrera, a former colleague of mine, a podcast that we called the Sanitation Anti-Podcast. Welcome to the Sanitation Anti-Podcast. A podcast on leadership and collaboration for sanitation change. You might wonder why this is called the Sanitation Anti-Podcast. Well, this podcast is first of all meant for the students of IH Delft Master Program in Sanitation. And particularly we are doing this within the module called Leadership and Collaboration for Sanitation Change. And here comes the anti part. Is leadership the antithesis of collaboration? How these two concepts, leadership and collaboration, are related? And how do they relate to ideas, to processes of change? But it's also the sanitation anti-podcast because we are hosting it from the opposite sides of the world, geographic antipods. My name is Andres Cabrera. I am based in Brisbane, Australia. In the podcast, we interviewed professionals in the field of sanitation, including alumni of our master program, to learn about their experience and in particular to reflect on some of the leadership and collaboration skills that are needed to effectively work in that field, sanitation. One of the episodes with Jennifer Lamb, a sanitation expert working in the humanitarian sector, touched upon, among many other things, also to the issue of active listening. Um, so I recently carried out some research in Cox's Bazaar, the Rohingya crisis um, that's unfolded from Myanmar into Bangladesh, and I think um, you know, I didn't come with a set agenda. You know, I think there was a big expectation from my fellow Wash colleagues that I had, you know, a standard template of questions. What do I need to ask? How many focus group discussions do I need to facilitate? How many people need to be there? And, you know, and my take was that I didn't want to do that. I, you know, the expectation was there. But what I said to the team was, leave me to it. You know, I'm going to wander around with a translator and, and just observe and, you know, do that more participant in observation um, way of working and then you know as and when people invite us you know indoors we we, we then discussed um, kind of openly just day-to-day -day things and then you know sometimes we'd find we'd be there for like three hours four hours and just you know talking about things and uh, the communities that we did speak to did really appreciate the fact that we took time to sort of just sit down and not have a set agenda from day one. After listening to the podcast the students were joining an online session with Andres and myself to further learn and discuss about the topic, in that case, active listening. And I remember that after the session, I told Andres, hey, when talking to Jenny and recording the podcast, we were exactly practicing what we've been teaching today, active listening. Maybe the student, to practice act active listening, they should make a podcast too. And indeed, making a podcast is a good way to practice and to learn the art of interviewing in general, and specifically the art of listening. There is plenty of literature and studies on listening. There are different ways of listening, passive listening, active listening, critical listening, 
I personally find inspiring the seven rules of the art of listening crafted by Marinella Sclavi, an architect, urban planner, who pioneered participatory and nonviolent methodologies for conflict management in urban planning in Italy. And I will quote one of those rules. A good listener is an explorer of possible worlds. The signals which he or she finds most important are the ones that seem both negligible and annoying, both marginal and irritating, since they refuse to mesh with previous convictions and certainties. End of quote. Marinella Sclavi tells us that a good listener is an explorer of possible worlds. Here, imagination is key. And if you think about it, podcasts free your imagination. It is not like a video where you simultaneously watch and listen. In the podcast, when you listen to a story, you have to imagine it and visualize it by yourself. Podcast elicit your imagination. The exploration of possible worlds. You have to pay attention to the negligible and annoying signals, active listening. And this is, of course, challenging. And the big challenge for me is to find, for instance, the right balance between scripting the interview or recording a free-flowing conversation. The first will sound brilliant, sharp, with a good rhythm, but maybe it is in the second, the free flow, that more likely the negligible, the annoying, the marginal, or the irritating will pop up. To sum up, in podcasting, we and our students, we can practice the art of active listening. Second memo, editing. The second feature of podcasting that I want to discuss is editing. Or in other words, listening to your own voice as author. I have a background in political science, so I tend to see a lot of politics in this process, in the process of editing. Whose voices do we want to make heard through our podcast? This, for me, is a political choice. The first podcast I did was about the Nile River. Welcome to the Sources of the Nile, a podcast about media, science and water diplomacy in the Nile Basin. When it comes to the Nile and nowadays the controversy around the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, if you organize a webinar, you always have to invite an Ethiopian, a Sudanese, and an Egyptian to have all the three countries represented. But in this way, we all contribute to replicate and legitimize the national interest perspective, which is the mainstream narrative promoted by the three different governments. You speak because of your nationality. Why not instead inviting people on the basis of the academic background, for instance, an anthropologist, an hydrologist, and a natural scientist, regardless of the passport. Why not recording the birds to hear the voice of nature, or why not recording the voice of the river itself? To whom do you want to give voice in your podcast? This is also a political choice. And editing is a powerful but also delicate process. It is indeed a political process, because basically you can give or take away voice. You can almost manipulate the conversation if you want. If your conversation is scripted, then you might need little editing and you will be able to reflect and air what literally the interlocutor said without too much cuts. But if you have a free-flowing conversation, then you may need to make a lot of editorial choices as author. And again, there's not right or wrong here, but I believe that the voice of the author is important. 
you, as the host of the podcast, you should be accountable for that, for your voice. I think that it, it is important to clearly demarcate that. For instance, in the Nile podcast, there was first the interview, and then at the end, after a short music transition, I was commenting on it, on the interview, and I was sharing my takeaway of the conversation. Thank you very much, Mina. Thanks for joining the Sources of the Nile. Thank you, Emmanuel, so much. In this book, Together, The Rituals, Pleasures and Politics of Cooperation, sociologist Richard Sennett describes musical rehearsals as an example of dialogic conversation. A dialogic conversation is a conversation that might not end in finding common ground and shared agreement, but still, in this conversation, people become more aware of their own views and learn to better understand each other. This is what musicians do when rehearsing, adjusting to each other's way of playing a certain piece of music. And indeed, what Mina described looks like another good example of dialogic conversation. Music in the Nile project does not really lead to the creation of a new ideal Nile identity, but rather it is used to establish connections. Mina, Mina repeated several times this word, connection connections between different rhythms, scales, instruments and languages. Connections that made also people reflect and rethink about their own identity, as in the example of the young Egyptian discovering their connections with Sub-Saharan Africa. So, establishing connections while at the same time acknowledging differences. Mina, in fact, pointed also at the fact that some musical pieces might be more collaborative while others may bring out one specific style, tradition or instrument. And I personally think that creating connections and acknowledging differences are key to learn how to stay in the conflict, including water conflicts. So thanks Mina and thanks to the Nile Project for their music and their inspiring activity. Editing implies deciding what to keep of your recorded interview and what to cut, what can be left out. Sometimes it can be very painful. When asked to record a podcast, students can therefore learn a lot and reflect on their learning by identifying the most important points of the conversation and by trying to summarize in their own words what they've learned in that conversation. So editing is a delicate political process and listening to and reflecting on your voice as author can be a rewarding learning process as well. Third memo, sharing. Sharing is about the audience voice. Podcast is a one-to-one -one medium. It is an intimate experience. And if you compare it with other digital activities, such as the scrolling up and down in social media like Twitter, Facebook or Instagram, podcast is a slow experience. So, how do you reward such engagement? How do you reward a listener that decides to spend with you with your voice, 15, 20, 40 minutes of his, her day, maybe every week. It is important to plan for feedback, to listen to your audience, to promote a conversation around the podcast, for instance, by embedding the podcast in a blog post that people can later comment, or by combining podcasts with drawing, for instance, inviting people to draw the stories that they listen to. As I said earlier, a podcast can be a powerful medium to create or reinforce relations within a community of interest or practice, 
like the students in that course. An easy way to collect feedback by the students is to discuss the podcast during class. For my course on research methods, for instance, I recorded a three-episode series on interdisciplinarity in water education. The Digital Club is a podcast for online water education. The focus of this first series is interdisciplinarity in water education. And today we are going to talk about participatory water management. The aim of that podcast was to make students thinking if and how to develop an inter- or transdisciplinary research project for their thesis. I also asked them to record their impressions and thoughts in an audio file, and my plan was to later edit their comments in the final part of the podcast. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Only a few of them did it, and the few who recorded a short audio clip didn't want them to be publicly added to the podcast episode. So another trick I used to activate the students around the podcast was to ask them to suggest alternative titles to each episode. In this way, I push them to summarize the main points discussed or the main lessons learned. And overall, it was a fun exercise. So sharing your podcast with your audience and listening to their voice is a key process to create and nurture a community and I think also to improve your own work. Listening, editing and sharing. These are the three memos on podcasting for the next education that I wanted to share with you today. And if you want to learn more about these reflections and about the experience of the podcast, The Sources of the Nile, I invite you to read the article that I recently published in Open Access with Emily Baust in the Journal of Science Communication. You can find the reference of the article in the video of this presentation. Thanks for listening. I hope you hear your comments and feedback. You can drop me an email at the address that also you find in the video of this presentation. Thank you.